afternoon. So let me, it's called business to buttons. Let me see who's more on the button side. Who considers themselves a designer? Okay. Let's see where the business part is. Who considers themselves a business person? And who is at the intersection and feels like they're a great designer and they know something about business? Okay, good. That's where you should be. <laughs> Because I'm going to talk about value proposition design. I'm going to be a bit more on the business side, but I believe that today technology people and design should actually understand business and the why, the goals, extremely well. How are you going to do good design if you don't understand the why? Okay. So we're going to look at the value proposition canvas, a tool that we made from one of these two books. But I'm mainly going to share some of the lessons. Let me just see to get a feel for the audience. Who of you has ever heard of or used the business model canvas? Okay, who of you has ever heard or used the value proposition canvas? Okay, so a bit less. We're going to play with that a little bit later. I'm going to share a couple of lessons. Most of my time, I'm actually not speaking or writing. I'm uh, trying to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> this is my side job. Um, we're trying to create something crazy, probably a 20-year vision the strategic operating system for companies like Nestle, GE, you know, the biggest companies in the world. So completely crazy. <laughs> so we need to understand the why of our customers really well. So when I got invited, I thought, wow, that's great. But then I realized, well, buttons? What do I know about design? I'm a designer at heart, <laughs> but I don't have a design profession. And I wasn't sure, could I really deliver something of value to a design audience or you know, design and business, but design profession? And then I fell into this, you know, the creative process. I guess you've seen this slide. It's my favorite slide. <laughs> Who's ever been in this situation? Right? Work begins, <laughs> you procrastinate for months, then you panic, and you say, shit, I've got to get it done. And then you sweat. Huh? Been there? Okay. So I did figure out <laughs> that actually I have something to say even at uh, 4 o'clock in the evening. I hope I can keep you awake, right? So I think real magic happens, value for customers, but also for the business, because at the end of the day, you know, we, don't, we shouldn't be just business driven, but we need to create financially sustainable organizations if we want to continue to create value for customers. We shouldn't forget, of course, ethics and morals in the process, as we heard today, which I fully agree with. Okay? But I think this intersection between design, technology, customers, and business is where real magic happens. And I've been living at this intersection. I've been trying to make tools so people from the different areas here can better collaborate and create value. Because I don't think these collaborations are great yet. <laughs> Here's some proof. 72% of all new product and service launches flop. 72%. What does that mean? Let me translate. 7 out of 10 new products or services, they fail. So look around you. There are only three per 10 people <laughs> can do the math. Look around you. Seven of you are working on something that's going to fail. Hands up if you're working on something that's going to flop. And some of you know it. Some of you <laughs> don't want to put your hand up because you don't want to say, tell the truth, right? Now, is it because people are stupid? Absolutely not. It's because the processes are often broken. It's how we work that leads to this. It's not the people themselves. It's the processes that we have in companies often, in particular when we do new stuff. Okay? So let's get beyond this, but I want to get us to discuss very quickly. Chat with your seat neighbor for one minute. One minute. Have you ever been in a situation where a product or service has flopped because there was bad collaboration between the different stakeholders, meaning design, technology, and business? Okay. Share one, one of your Strongest experience in this field. Just one minute, okay? With your seat neighbor. Let's go. With your seat neighbor. Come on. One minute. One minute. That's it.
Okay. Okay. <laughs> Brought my Swiss bell. I'm from Switzerland. <laughs> Can we agree on something that when I ring the bell that you put your, that you actually just focus on me again? Put your hands up if that's okay with you. Swiss timekeeping. Good. <laughs> I did this in Kuwait last week and then a Lebanese came up and said, Alex, you can't do that. We do that for the goats. It's disrespectful. I said, but it works. <laughs> so timekeeping because I'm going to do a couple of exercises like this um, afterwards. Okay. So he said seven out of ten products flop. Why is that? Since the Swiss are not very funny, I'm going to show you a Silicon Valley parody telling us why do products often flop. Let's see if the sound works. As usual when you test it, it doesn't work. See? Nope. Okay. So we won't be funny because I can't. I'm Swiss. We don't do that. So even when I business. try to make That's a joke, exciting. Oh, here we go. So you can laugh when you want to make me happy, but you don't have to, okay? Let's see if this hey, works. Hey, I've got a great idea for a business. That's exciting. Tell me about it. I've developed a chemical isomer that links to volatile organic compounds causing carbon bonds to rupture and wraps them in a nanotube coating. Huh. That's a little confusing. Can you dumb it down for me? Sure. What I do is I take a proprietary isomer that I developed with a picric acid wash that hollows out the carbon bonds and replaces them with a nanotube wrapping. Okay, so I guess it's pretty technical. Oh yeah. I've been working on this isomer for nine years. So what's the business idea? To sell it. To who? Everybody will want one. What for? so they can wrap their volatile organic compounds in carbon nanotubes. Hmm, I think you might need a target customer. I don't think I need to wrap my compounds in your nanotube. Well, maybe not you. So, for people who buy it, what's the value you are providing them? I've developed a chemical isomer <laughs> that links to volatile organic compounds causing carbon bonds to rupture and wraps them in a nanotube coating. You've said that already. This is getting annoying. Why should anyone care about your isomer? I spent nine years on this. <laughs> okay. Obviously, this is just the parody. It would never happen to any of us, right? But the reality is we get so excited about what we're doing and what we're working on that we sometimes forget this very simple thing of, you know, mapping back to the customer how are we really creating value and why, okay? So while it's common sense, it's not common practice. So I think we can do better. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things, six things actually, five, six, if I can make it. The UX and UI of business tools, my profession, I make tools for business people, designers, technologists, understanding value propositions. We're going to play with the value proposition canvas. And then this lean startup thing. Who's heard of lean startup? So I'll take <laughs> kind of an interesting angle on it. Build, measure, learn. Really? You'll see. Okay, <laughs> testing lessons from the field if we get there, okay? So let's start with this one. Who of you has one of these in their pocket today? One of these? Like this one? You, but you're a really interesting person. Like this is the first mobile phone ever. It's the Motorola Dynatac. You have one in your pocket? Can you pull it out? I mean, out of your suitcase, sorry. <laughs> so crazy, right? 1985, nobody has these things anymore. Would pull it out in a meeting. Well, if we look at the tools we often pull out in business and design meetings, they're from 1985. Like, why the heck would you do that? You don't pull out a phone from 1985. So why is it when it comes to some of the business tools we use in design, technology, you know, marketing, et cetera, when we work together, they come from 1985. The world changed a little bit since then. So I think that's a bit of a problem. So I love this quote from Marshall McLuhan, our age of anxiety is the result of trying to do today's jobs with yesterday's tools. So I think tools are not just, ah, oh, templates, ah, oh, I can make one. And no, I think these are serious things that help us do better work. And they actually help us always focus on the why and they help us go beyond what I see a lot in meetings with business people, of course, but also designers, a lot of blah, blah, blah. How do we get beyond the blah, blah with better tools? When we started out, when I started out um, working, doing a, a doctoral thesis on this, 
we came up with this one for the topic of business models. And the idea was to create something that can tell the story, I'm talking about stories, tells the story of how as an organization you create, deliver, and capture value, okay? So that thing worked pretty well. And we were pretty curious. So a lot of views on YouTube, but also millions of downloads. So that made us curious. When I say us, it was then, back then, my former PhD supervisor, now my co-author co and friend, Yves Pinier. We asked ourselves why, and we did a little bit of research. So we figured out business tools like that, like the business model canvas, work well because they're visual, according to the people we interviewed, because they facilitate a group discussion, okay, which is very important in today's world where a lot of people collaborate on products, okay, and they're practical and simple, conceptually sound, which is actually something that's pretty hard to achieve. And the last one, they're intuitive. We can pull them out in a meeting and we can start working with them. We get better and better with them, okay? So that's the first part. Then we asked, well, how did this thing actually create value for you? And we figured out, here are a couple of things that I'm going to emphasize just because it's important for this audience. Well, it creates a shared language. Better tools, personas is one that you're familiar with, but I think we need to go beyond those, right? Story mapping is another one. There's a series of tools that we need to master because they create a shared language. It's incredibly important, shared visual language. They lead to better teamwork and very important for us, better collaboration across disciplines because design alone, business alone, technology alone can't do it. And we know that, but we don't have yet the right processes to work well in these multidisciplinary teams. So we need to get there, okay? So this was where we started out and the idea was Okay, people are going to map their business models. And they did. Millions, literally millions of people did that. But then we saw another phenomena, like often when you design, well, the reality looked different. Who have used, a lot of you had your hands up. Who have you done this? Tons of sticky note in that value proposition block. <laughs> right? Well, you were using the wrong tool for the wrong job. And we realized that, that, well, maybe we're doing something wrong here. We need another tool. One, for those of you who know the business model canvas, this is the box for the value proposition. Maybe we need another tool, not to tell the story of how we create value as a business, but how we create value for customers. So he said, ah, oh, let's come up with another tool. One that goes hand in hand, right? So we focused on here, the value proposition for specific customers. We wrote a new book, and we came up with this framework, which we're going to look at a little bit later on, which is, OK, we have customers. Could we go beyond the persona and really uh, understand their jobs, pains, and gains? And then map back to that how our products and services are actually creating value. And use it as a map that explicitly shows throughout a project from the idea to the implementation how we're creating value for customers. And it's literally a map because this will change with your customer understanding. We heard a lot about talking to customers and understanding. It's part of your profession, right? Okay, gives you the fit, allows you to tell the story. The story of how you create value for customers. It answers the why again and again and again. So it's different from the business why. This is the customer why. How are you creating value for your customer, okay? So we came up with this tool, the value proposition canvas, and we started using it. What we realized is there is actually some value in these business tools, so at that point we had two, and what I realized is there's a UI and a UX to business tools. Most frameworks, they stay frameworks, and they suck as to using them in a meeting. Great frameworks, good ideas, but nobody worked on the user experience of using that tool in a business meeting or in a design meeting or in, in a technology meeting. So we started like insanely working on this. For the tool you've just seen, the value proposition canvas, which I'll explain in a minute, it worked, it started out like this. We had the concepts, we had to put them together. It looked like this. It was something that in a talk at Stanford, I drew on the iPad, it looked like this. And then people said, oh, that's an evolution from your first tool that replaces the first one. We said, no, you don't get it. But we also realized maybe we're just too stupid in terms of tool design to not make it explicit what this thing is for. So we went through all of these design iterations with uh, Alan Smith, my co-founder and designer, then all of a sudden, this circle and square started to emerge, okay? And we realized, hmm, we're on to something. That could work. 
and it became the value proposition canvas. So we worked on the interface of the business tool. The concepts were right, we knew that, but we had the interface wrong. Crazy, right? Interface of a business tool. Who would think that? Well, it turns out if you get it right, people use it, which led to a great user experience, okay? So that's why the tool kind of took off. And then the other thing, why these, this circle and square work is because it's an and, all of a sudden you could say, oh, I can put my customers into this bigger picture and my value proposition. Oh, and maybe I have two customer segments and have two value propositions. So it's like Lego, you can put them together. And that's the way you want to use all kinds of tools that you use in design. You want to use them together and you want to figure out what are the APIs, the application programming interfaces between your tools. So to a certain extent, we need to become surgeons of business tools and design tools, okay? So let's go into the value proposition canvas, and I'll quickly show you a video. I'll give you an example, and then I'm going to get you to start uh, working with a little exercise, okay? Because only about a third has, has heard of the tool or used the tool. Every day, companies design products and services to improve their customers' lives. 72% of new product and service innovations fail to deliver on expectations. This means that customers don't care about 7 out of 10 new products introduced to the market. It doesn't have to be this way. Just like you create value for your business with a business model canvas, there is in fact a tool to intentionally visualize, design and test how you create value for customers. It's called the Value Proposition Canvas. The value proposition canvas is composed of two parts, the customer profile and the value map. With the customer profile, you describe the jobs your customers try to get done. Jobs can be functional, like getting from A to B, social, like impressing friends and colleagues, or emotional, like gaining peace of mind. You highlight your customers' pains, which annoy customers while trying to get a job done. Pains and negative outcomes that customers hope to avoid, like dissatisfactions of existing solutions and challenges, frustrations, risks or obstacles related to performing a job. And you outline customer gains which describe how customers measure the success of a job well done. Gains are positive outcomes that customers hope to achieve, like concrete results, benefits and even aspirations. Use the customer profile to visualise, test and track your understanding of the people or companies you intend to create value for. It's a map that becomes clearer the more you learn about your customers. The second part of the canvas is the value map. With it, you list the products and services your value proposition builds on. You describe in which way these products, services and features are pain relievers, how they eliminate, reduce or minimize pains customers care about, making their life easier. And you outline in which way they are game creators, how they produce, increase or maximize outcomes and benefits that your customers expect, desire or would be surprised by. The value map makes explicit how your products and services relieve pains and create gains. Use it to design, test and iterate your value proposition until you figure out what resonates with customers. You achieve fit by creating a clear connection between what matters to customers and how your products, services and features ease pains and create gains. Great value propositions target essential customer jobs, pains and gains and do so extremely well. Your customer profile may contain countless jobs, pains and gains, but your value map highlights which ones you intend to focus on. But don't forget, an outstanding value proposition can still fail if your business model is flawed. Successful companies embed outstanding value propositions in scalable and profitable business models. Okay. So on the right-hand side, we understand the customer. Different version, you could say, oh, but that's a persona. Well, no, you look at the actionable stuff that really matters to customers for your product. Jobs, pains, and gains. What are they trying to get done? What pisses them off? And what are they trying to achieve? Okay? And on the left-hand side, you map. You make explicit. What exactly are we addressing? Which pains are we addressing? Which gains are we addressing? So you make a selection. Over here, understanding. Over here, design. And that goes from the strategic design of the products and services, the value proposition, all the way down to website design, all the way down to designing certain aspects of a website. Because all of those things have one purpose, to create value for the customer 
And if we think the bigger picture, value for the business, right? And hopefully you're in a business that allows you to participate. So value proposition canvas. That's what we're going to work on a little bit. But first I wanna, want us just to look at this thing called jobs to be done, customer jobs. Who's worked with jobs, the jobs to be done concept? Okay, if you haven't, I would highly recommend you look at it. There are a couple of authors out there that talk about it. Tony Ulwick and Clay Christensen really go a bit deeper. Because at the end of the day, you're helping customers get something done. You don't ask them what do you want, you ask them what are you trying to get done, and you're helping them that get that done. Now, let's look at this for a second. In the music industry, jobs actually don't change very much, but the solutions do. So I like this just as an illustration of how a good customer understanding is more important than looking at the solution all the time. So if we look at the music industry, so the job to be done is listening to music. The solutions were what in 1983? We had records. Anybody remember records? If I tell my kids a record, <laughs> what? <laughs> like in the museum? Then over here we have, so that was a big part. We have the cassettes, okay, that was 47%. And here we have the CDs, which was only 0.5%. Now let's look at what happened here over the next couple of decades. So what happens is the cassettes eat up the vinyl, the LPs, right? Cassettes get bigger and CDs at the same time eat up cassettes, okay? CDs take over everything. Many of us remember that. And then what happened? All of a sudden in 2003, CDs, they dominate the market and then it changes, okay? Well, the internet became big download, a lot there, okay? Albums <laughs> on the internet, music videos. So it goes away. Okay, it goes away, and in 2013, the picture is very diverse. So see how fast the solutions can change? So if you have a fundamentally good customer understanding, it'll be a lot easier, in terms of jobs, pains, and gains, of staying up to date with the technology solutions. It's a pretty amazing thing how fast that goes, and we see that in many, many different industries and areas, okay? So if we look back at the bigger picture, I'm gonna give you one example, and it's not at the level of user experience design, it's at the level of business design, okay? But I think it's good for us to think business because together, as collaborators from those four areas, remember that I mentioned, we create value together. I think business people should become better designers and designers should become better business people, okay? Who agrees with that? Let me see, took a little bit of a risk there. <laughs> see, <laughs> Did nobody put their hand up, I should have just left the stage. So let's look at this thing called Hilti. Anybody of you ever heard of Hilti? Funny, right? None of you is in the construction industry. That's their customer segment. I'm always amazed. They have a wonderful brand. What did Hilti do? Well, they were a manufacturing company focusing on selling light machine tools for builders like drills, okay? Then they asked themselves a couple, one, two decades ago, man, we make great drills, but they're so good the customers never replace them. How can we continue to exist, not even to grow, but just to, to sell enough so we could pay our people? So they had to kickstart growth and they said, well, we need to understand customers. Good news is they had a direct sales force that could really talk with customers deeply. And what they figured out is the biggest job to be done is obviously not to buy a drill, not even to make a hole. What was the biggest problem of these construction workers? and their companies. The biggest job was this, managing, maintaining, and replacing the tools, meaning having the right tool at the right construction site at the right time. Why do you think that's such a big issue for a construction company? Right tool, right place, right time, and it needs to work? Because if it doesn't, this small, silly tool, teams might stop, the whole construction site might stop, and it becomes very expensive for the construction companies because they have to pay penalties. That was the big job, the big pain. So the question is, okay, how does a customer profile then look like? So Hilti started not just mapping out the customer profile of construction workers, but they said, let's try to understand the construction companies, and in particular, their CEOs. Okay, so who you target is important. So they started to understand. I'll keep it high level. If you do this for real, you would go a lot more in detail, okay? So the examples are relatively high level. So take a CEO of a construction company, medium, small, um, would be finding and executing contracts, respecting deadlines, planning the fleet, okay? That's what they're trying to get done. What are the pains related to that? 
Well, they want the newest tools, but they don't want to invest in tools. They definitely don't want broken tools, stolen tools, or delays resulting from that, because that leads to penalties, leads to stress, leads to financial problems. So we have the pains. And when you think of pains, it's not just stuff that doesn't work, it's risks that customers, users might have, that they fear, okay? Real or not doesn't matter. It's a fear of a customer that we should understand. Now, what were the objectives? Obviously, they want to have profitable contracts. They want access to newest tools because that leads to safety. Most important, they want 100% uptime and predictable costs. Okay, so you can already see there are conflicts here. Newest tools, but they don't want to invest in them. So what could Hilti do? What could they do in terms of product or service design? How could they create value? Would another drill do it? Would another better drill, faster, more precise, better looking? Wouldn't work, right? So they asked themselves, well, if we prioritize here, most important, they started to prioritize these jobs, pains, and gains. They asked themselves, what could we create? What's the value proposition to help these people, the new thing that they could create to create more growth? And they came up with this thing here. Just very briefly. Have you ever wanted to just focus on your work and forget about administrative issues and managing your tool fleet? If so, Tool Fleet Management, Hilti's long-term tool usage service, is for you. We take care of your tools while you focus on the job. Hilti helps assure that your team will have the best tools, each unique and labeled using RFID and an inventory number so you can maintain control of your tool fleet. If something breaks down, no problem. Hilti has another way to make your work easier. We repair or replace your tools quickly at no additional cost. Hilti will also update your tools on a regular basis, always with the latest generation models. All this on a single monthly invoice. Okay, see how that works? So let's map this out. Here we have the service, but the service alone doesn't matter. It only matters if it addresses jobs, pains, and gains. So let's make this mapping explicit. Okay, well, no cost for repair and replacement. Oh, we saw something over there. Subscription model. Oh, so I get access to the newest tool and I don't have to pay an upfront investment? Huh, that sounds like an interesting thing, relieving some of my headaches. Let's look at the gain creators. Oh, I now really get access to the newest tools? Hmm, helps me with safety. And you replace my tools if they're broken? I don't have to take care of shipping them around? Hilti took over the entire logistics, which is a pain reliever and a gain creator at the same time, okay? And all of that leads to what? Sound cost management. So you need the same kind of thinking at the strategic level like here, or at the tactical level where you're making things happen. Because behind this, there was service design, there was an online fleet management system, but you can only make that when you understand the real motivations of your customers. So you need to go deep. And again, it sounds like, oh, common sense, not common practice. If you don't map this, you won't get it right because you don't understand customers, and you won't get your teams to understand because the technology people, the business people, and the design people don't speak together based on the same understanding of customers. You ever seen that? Not having a shared understanding of customers? Some of you smiling, right? Never happened in your company, right? So let me get you to work. So we're going to do a little exercise, I believe, in learning by doing. So we're going to distribute now. I'm going to explain how. All of you, if we can get started, yeah. All of you, are you going to actually work in groups of two? Let me correct. You're going to work in groups of two. As groups of two, you're going to get one value proposition canvas. So when you get the pile, please hand it over to the next people, OK? They're free to download. It's only one per two. I know people start sh grabbing them. You also get a set of stickers, OK? You get a set of stickers. And on those stickers, you have the elements of the customer profile. You should, normally, of the customer profile and the value map of Tesla. What you're going to do first, everybody listen, what you're going to do first is you're going to take the stickers, the yellow ones, the customer profile, and you're simply going to map out the customer profile of a Tesla buyer. That was the initial customer that Tesla targeted for the Model S. Upper middle class American male, higher income. The last conference somebody said, why do you put male there? Well, because that's who they targeted. They, sorry, they didn't target women there. So that was the segment that they were targeting. 
So use the yellow stickers, the yellow stickers here, and map out the customer profile, okay? Just the circle with the yellow stickers, Tesla. Now, to make it competitive, I have Swiss chocolate with me. The first team gets a wonderful little box of access to heaven, okay? So let's go. You got three minutes. No, no, you can't have it yet. <laughs> you need to get it done first. Oh, shit. I thought you were talking about the chocolate. Okay, just the circle. Just the circle. Is it a job? Is it a pain? Is it a gain? Jobs, pains, gains of a Tesla buyer. Just the, the yellow ones. Let's see if you paid attention. You're going to get grades at the end of this. Done. Okay, we got the first team. Gets the chocolate. Everybody else, hurry up. Let me see if it's right. Close. <laughs> there you go. Okay. It's already gone, the chocolate, sorry. <laughs> There's no, no second price. Okay, some laggards. <laughs> Got it, good. No more chocolate. Okay. Ten more seconds, ten more seconds for those who are not done. There's no more chocolate. Okay. Okay, Shh. let's look at this together. So you got a, a slightly simplified version. I'm going to give you the jobs, pains, and gains, one or two more here. So if you look at, at this customer segment, we have commuting to work, conveying an image of success. So again, there's one or two more here. Differentiating from others, occasional long distance trip, being in sync with personal values. Remember in the video, we said there are functional jobs, social jobs, and emotional jobs. What would be a, a social job here? Convey an image of success, right? That's not a functional job. Okay, so even when you design, you need to ask yourself, what are the functional jobs, really purely technical, and which ones are the social jobs or the emotional jobs? Like nobody buys a Swiss watch to read the time, right? You buy a Japanese watch for that. <laughs> okay, so bad joke, sorry. Told ya. <laughs> So here, now let's look at the pains. We have charging time, frequent charging, fear of dead battery, lack of space, geeky perception. This one's interesting. I did this with, with 700 engineers at, at SAP, and they said, Alex, geeky perception is good, right? I said, look at the customer segment. <laughs> What's good in one segment is, not, is a pain for another, OK? These people do not want to be perceived as, as geeks, OK? So then we have the gains. What are they trying to achieve? Well, they want performance. They want attractive design. They want a certain range. They want safety. And they want the latest features. Actually, we're talking more about a car as a piece of software. OK. So what I want you to do now, based on this, is the next step. Okay, We got the jobs, pains, and gains. 
And now you need to come up with the value proposition. You got the stickers, so it's pretty straightforward. You put the stickers on the square. I got one more box of chocolate. Let's see, OK? Let's go. Over here was first. Sorry, let me check. It's kind of right. Yeah, close enough. Close enough. Close enough. There you go. It's already done. No more chocolate. No more chocolate. Sorry. Okay. Okay, let's look at this together. Now, you know what? It actually doesn't matter that much where you put them because at the end of the day, when you work as a team, you just need to get two things right. Everybody in the team needs to agree that it should be there on that side and on that side. And what else? Even more important, it should correspond to the reality that those are the jobs, pains, and gains of your customers, and you need to test them. We'll get to that. So let's look at this side here. I just put the car here, okay, just the car, but there are other things that we could also put as services if we want. But here, most important, well, we have some of the kind of headache pills for this over here, battery capacity, high-speed charging, free charging stations. Think of it, Tesla made charging stations available throughout the US and in Europe for free. It's as if a Volvo, Renault would have gas stations. That's an incredible investment, right? So that you could say could be a service. If I put it here as a, as a pain reliever because these are fears that these people have, even if it doesn't correspond to the reality, okay? Then we have two more. The luxury image, okay? These guys, and guys literally, they don't want a geeky perception. They want an image that corresponds to, hey, you know, this is a real car. This is like a German car, and it's Silicon Valley. Kind of interesting, right? And then the last one, the space, that blew me away. Kind of quite a lot of space because there's no engine. Now let's look at the gain creator. So I think the Tesla did what they had to do to take away the fears, but they, where they really excel is at the top, okay? So here we have the performance first, and then obviously we have the range, which is important still, okay? But together with the performance, I think the second most important is award-winning design. Turns out Tesla, for their designers and for their engineers, they put German cars, BMW and BMWs and Mercedeses in the courtyard, so every evening they could drive home with a different car. They couldn't keep them, they had to bring them back, but it was a German car to get the experience. Not a French car, okay? not an American car, sorry, not a Swedish car. <laughs> It's not Swedish anymore, if I understood right. <laughs> so a real performance engine, OK? Then this becomes a lot more of a software product. It's not just hardware anymore. Cars actually get better if the software gets better, OK? Luckily, most cars are not powered by Microsoft yet, right? <laughs> but can we trust Tesla? We're not so sure yet, right? But it turns out, even though what we see in the press now, trying to kind of create some fear around it, Tesla is rated as the safest car, not the safest electrical car, the safest car by the US government agencies, okay? So gives us this connection between what matters to customers and how we actually create value. So the question is, is there a fit between the two? Again, this is what we observe. We don't design a customer. Here, there are a lot of sticky notes. Over here is where we make design choices on the strategic level and on the implementation level, okay? 
if you use this as a communication tool, you will get a lot clearer. So if we look at, did this work? Well, it's one of the most innovative companies, but also in terms of sales, it's a bit older numbers from last year, Tesla outsold all other electric vehicles by far, but they also outsold other cars which they consider as competitors, Audi, BMW, and Mercedes, okay? Now that was in the US. On the global stage for a very long time, they were number two. They were behind the Nissan Leaf until, you might remember this, they launched the new model and they pre-sold in one week 325,000 cars. They didn't even have the factories to do it and not even the design. The car wasn't done. And 325,000 people put money on the table to get that car. Guess what? Elon Musk took that money, went to the banks, or that proof, that evidence, and said, hey, bank, can you give me a couple of billion dollars so I can build the factories? Here's the proof. Pretty strategic, pretty interesting, right? But fit, right? Real fit, love mark brand. So when we look at fit, we actually want to go beyond the kind of high level that I showed you. We want to be able to quantify gains and pains in terms of money, percentages, or time. Go to a bank, how long do I have to wait? Investment product, how much do I expect in terms of performance here, percentage, et cetera, okay? That means us, as designers of value, of value proposition designers, we need to ask how can we eliminate, decrease, reduce, or minimize the pains over there? And that goes at the strategic level and at the implementation level. And everybody should understand what we're trying to achieve as a team, as an organization, okay? goes even beyond companies, it's for governments, not for profits, the same thing. How do we create value? Then on this side, it's about how do we create, increase, improve, or maximize gains. Again, if we can quantify, we should. Because if you can't quantify over here, how are you going to judge if your design actually creates value? Do you see what I mean? We're often very fuzzy over here. Personas for me are too fuzzy the sense that how am I going to make a good design, design decision if I don't know what jobs, pains, and gains really mean in a hardcore way, okay? So it makes those things practical. And it's not either or, it's personas and this kind of tool, okay? So not one or the other. So what we've seen in the other example is simply just something like this. What kind of range do these customers expect? What kind of range do we deliver? We should be able to do that for our products. Waiting time on a website, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Good. Now, don't have a lot, a lot of time left. Two more things to say. First, build, measure, learn. Really? Who performs build, measure, learn? Who does this stuff? Lean startup. It's not a trick question. You can put up your hand if you do it. Who does it? Who tests their designs, their user experiences? Who? I was getting a bit nervous here. <laughs> so we can just use a different word, right? But here's the thing. So, of course, this is important. I'll give you a counterexample of Tesla. Anybody remember Better Place? Okay, Better Place, what did they try to do? Said, well, we want to take away the biggest pain of electric vehicles. What's the biggest pain? Charging time, right? What if I could drive in a battery swapping station, change the battery, and drive out? Wouldn't that be great? Of course. So what did Better Place do? They started building that infrastructure because they raised a lot of money because they had a senior executive who was going to be the CEO of SAP, so very experienced. He could sell to investors, and then they went bankrupt. How much money can you lose with this kind of idea? What do you think? Quite a bit, right? In their case, it was $850 million. <laughs> like, put a pile of, or some bags here and just light them, okay? It was because they didn't test nor their value proposition, nor their business model. So, of course, this doesn't work. So, okay, let's use this lean startup thing, testing our business ideas. Build, measure, learn, right? Build a prototype or a mock-up or a wireframe, measure with customers, and learn. Guess what happens if you tell people, build, measure, learn? Designers and technologists. They're going to build something. But what you want to first do is actually think, dream, conceptualize, and hypothesize, and ask yourself the why. So basically, before doing all of this, you need to shape your business ideas and ask one thing. What needs to be true for my idea to work? You come up with hypothesis, and then you can 
maybe build something, but probably not. And we'll see that in a second. So if we can switch to the iPad for a second. So your job is not actually to build, but when you go from idea to, can you see what this is? See if you, my drawing skills are good enough. From idea to, this is a hundred million dollar business. If you haven't seen it, flags on the rooftop and so on. Okay. Don't laugh. <laughs> it's not very flattering. Okay, what's what's at its maximum when you do that? It's uncertainty and risk. Okay? Uncertainty and risk is at its maximum. Should you build something to test now? No, you should do something else. The only thing you need to do, and you may build, maybe not, is to reduce uncertainty and risk. How do you do that? Well, could be that we build something, but what if you talk to customers first before you build anything, before you do a mock-up, etc.? We'll practice this in a second. You're very likely to be wrong. That's okay. Ten customers said you don't understand their business, you don't know what they want, you failed. Okay, we reduced risk. Okay, we do that again, we do a wireframe, whatever, okay? We fail again because they say you still don't get it. What is important is that we respect this. We start very cheap and we increase our investments over time. And for me, I think even a wireframe is sometimes too much of an investment if I didn't understand the jobs, pains, and gains of my customers yet, okay? So this is a really important drawing that you should also use with business people because testing and wireframes, they don't give a shit. But when you talk about risk and uncertainty and how to re reduce that, then you got their ear, okay? So we can switch back, please. So what I like here, if we can switch back to the slides, please, is this idea. Bring it back to, we heard about Intuit before, let's bring it back to better place. Most companies can say for every one of their failures, they had a spreadsheet that looked awesome. What does that mean? You can always make the numbers look good, but if you don't test, the numbers mean nothing, okay? So, Steve Blank, who you've certainly heard of, the kind of inventor of the lean startup before Eric Ries made it popular, says you need to get out of the building and talk to customers. So why don't we do that and ask ourselves that concrete thing, so I'll do a little exercise with you. What you really want to do before you build or wireframe anything is this. Ask yourself, what are the hypotheses and which ones are the most important ones? And then you wireframe, you test something, maybe you don't need to, okay? So IDEO likes to talk about design thinking and how you actually test things. So they talk about desirability, should, um, should we build it? Feasibility, can we build it? Viability, so do people want it? Um, do, should we do it from a financial point of view or can we build it? So it's the same thing for business models and value propositions. Okay, interesting thing here. Desirability, feasibility, viability. Do customers want it? Can I build it? Should I build it from a financial point of view? Okay, same thing, same thing here. For the right-hand side, for those of you who know the business model canvas, for the value proposition canvas, same thing. Now, what I want you to do for one minute, it's an exercise, customer discovery. Normally, you should be good at this, right? It's part of your job, doing customer discovery. Who's ever done customer discovery, talk to customers to test things? Great. Let's see how good you're at it. So, in groups of two, one of you is an entrepreneur, innovator, Okay, not a designer for a moment, entrepreneur, innovator, or intrapreneur, you're actually going to talk to a customer. Think of it this way, you are at Colgate, an innovator. And you, Colgate, you know Colgate, toothpaste, toothbrushes, you just invented a new tooth whitening device. Great technology. You can make up the features, the design, whatever you want, okay, that's up to you. Your only task is, to go talk to customers, it's your first series of customer discovery interviews, to figure out is there a market for this tooth whitening device. Got it? So in groups of two, same groups, one of you is the Colgate innovator and tries to figure out is there a market for this device. You can make up the features, everything. Let's go, one minute, one minute exercise. So, that doesn't work. They turn it off usually. Okay. I'll have another five minutes. Is that okay?
Okay. Okay. So, let's see how good you were. Let's see how good you were at this. So, normally, you should not ask for opinions. Like, would you buy this? Do you like this device? How much would you pay? That's not good. Why? Because you'll get opinions. What you should have done better, a lot better, is ask for, ask for facts. When is the last time you Googled white tooth whitening? When is the last time you spoke to your dentist about tooth whitening? Call me on this. You get facts. You get evidence. Customer discovery is not about opinions. It's about evidence, about facts, okay? Second little trap here. Who have you focused on the solution, the product, right? Would you buy this device? Well, I told you it's the first batch of customer discovery interviews. Maybe you didn't hear that or you didn't listen. You should have first focused on the circle. Remember the circle, then the square. What are the most important things you're struggling with? How does your tooth hygiene look every day? Okay? Customer first, jobs, pains, and gains. You don't need to build anything. You don't need even to have a drawing of that device. Your first series of customer discovery interviews is focused on the circle. Okay? That's the first thing you need to do. Simple lesson. Again, common sense, but not common practice. Okay? So when you have this thing, you know, this map, you have three goals. Invalidate what was wrong on your map. Okay, you may even I've seen more and more people taking these this value proposition canvas into customer discovery interviews. You cross out after 10, 20 what was wrong, okay? Or you validate after 10, 20, 100, 500 interviews, you start to see, well, those are patterns. You might see, oh, maybe I see the pattern in that segment, in that segment. You, so you start segmenting based on jobs, pains, and gains. And then, of course, while you're doing this, you will see a lot of new things. And I know you do this in your job, but do you map it explicitly and share with everybody else in your team and in other disciplines? That's the tricky thing, okay? We need to go beyond disciplines and share. If we don't have visual tools, we'll remain in the blah, blah, blah and continue to create seven out of 10 products that fail, okay? So here you can see some from a real project where this is actually an industrial company where they start putting this on the wall and they have a series of this. And if we look at a more concrete one, this was a customer profile, they put this number here so they kind of repurpose the tool, which means 11 out of the 20 interviews that they did had exactly this kind of pain, okay? Simple stuff, again, common sense, but mapping is not common practice, yet so powerful to discuss with business people and technology people in the whole process. Then we had another one here that we saw people labeled it C, this is the job, and these are the pains related to the job, so they would put letters on it. So simple stuff to have a shared language and a better understanding, in this case of the customer, before the design even. And the last thing I'll leave you with that, I need to stop after this, is working visually, which you in the design profession do really well, but you need to do this with business people. Display all of the customer interviews. Organize, find pattern in, patterns in those jobs, pains, and gains. Synthesize and come up with those new things, okay? And then you can make your persona after that. I think that's great, but not before. And then you start designing, okay? If you don't have this good understanding, design makes no sense. Even wireframing makes no sense, okay? You need to start from a good understanding here. And all I wanted to give you is this idea of visual tools. You can use ours, you can use others. It's extremely powerful. You already have a tradition of using this. Do this more with business people. That will help the whole kind of organizational space go beyond what I like to say, blah, blah, blah. We can't live with blah, blah, blah. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Please stay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alexander. So you got the two of us. Double the <laughs> questions. Yeah. So we've had a full day. We've yeah. been inspired. Uh, I have lots of ideas. How do I make this last? What would your advice be? Like doing the whole conference experience. Doing it. I think, you know, um, finding projects where you can actually almost infiltrate and start using these visual tools with, you know, people in your team, um, with business people, using their language. So, remember, I, I used uncertainty and risk.
think the big thing is we know, and when I say we, I'm a designer at heart, you know, <laughs> belong in this community. Um, when we use our jargon, people will go like this. If we start using business words, then design will come here. If we're open to business people and don't you know, vilify them, I heard today a couple of, you know, all these business people, and I think we're in it together, right? We're in it to create value, so we need to use each other's vocabulary and create a shared language. That's just kind of my take on it. Any design words that are, you know, like really horrible to hear for business people? Design words? Yeah. The prototyping. Make business people cringe. <laughs> okay. Prototyping. Really? Mock up. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Like in a, in a workshop, they'll like it. <laughs> okay. But not in a real meeting. <laughs> Depends. Good I to mean. know. <laughs> okay, so if we have a look at, at uh, the broader picture, like we've been here for a full day at this yeah. conference yeah. and we've had, is it eight speakers? Yeah. Uh, from you know sharing different perspectives and insights and you know some of them really gave us some shivers and tomorrow we go back to our ordinary jobs so yeah. how do you take action on, on all the inspiration and insights you you got from today like what, well, what would be your tip yeah. two things one I, I found it fascinating the passion at this conference you know just mm -hmm. also you know from the topics but also the audience really we want to create value we believe in the why we want to go beyond all oh, making money you know that kind of stuff I think that's great, and we should bring that back, and we should spread that passion. But again, kind of use the vocabulary that will get people in as partners, not as enemies. I usually like when people, after a conference, they say, they make a contract with themselves. Take a piece of paper, write down, what's the one thing you're going to do differently tomorrow? The mm -hmm. one thing. Just start with one. Because if you have five, you're never going to do them. And then sign it, okay? Sign it, because otherwise it's not a contract. I think it's as simple as that. And maybe not <laughs> think that everybody in your company is in the same mindset when you get back. Mm -hmm. That is so great. Thank you so much, Alexander, Thanks for a lot good for the advice. Thank you. Awesome to be here. And Thanks. here's, of course, a gift for you. Oh.